Well, I'm really excited about this episode. Today, uh, I will be interviewing Keith Kurlander, who is my business partner and uh, kind of co-revolutionist, I would say, in changing the way mental health care is done in this country and uh, also my co-host for this podcast. And Keith has a really interesting and uh, in some ways challenging story to tell um, from you know what he's been through that has made him into the person he is today. He has a background as a therapist um, and has been uh, shifting into um, really supporting and leading the the revolution in mental health care for the last few years. So I'm really excited to have an opportunity to um, hear Keith's story about um, how he got interested in these ways of working with people. And um, I think you're really going to enjoy hearing this uh, episode. Welcome, Keith. Thanks, Will. Well, so you've been through a lot in your life, and I wonder if you could start by just um, for our audience painting the picture of, you know, what are the headlines of what you've been through, what you've been struggling with? Yeah, thanks. So I guess I'll start more with struggle than tri- triumph. Um, uh, paint the picture of the struggle first. We could get into triumphs maybe later in the episode. Is that sound like a good plan? That sounds great. Yeah, so, you know, I've suffered historically from pretty severe mental illness, for lack of a better term. Uh, And, you know, to paint a picture at the height of my suffering, I was pretty sick. I have a bipolar diagnosis, bipolar 2 diagnosis but I would get severely uh, agitated, severely dissociated, uh, severe intrusive thoughts, violent intrusive thoughts. Um, I would have um, horrible insomnia and I would be very sick physically, pretty significant fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, IBS, daily migraines, um, Again, this is the height of my suffering. Uh, Very intense mixed states of depression and anxiety. Um, Feeling out of my body, depersonalization. uh, Feeling like things aren't real, derealization. Um, Very awkward thinking, bordering on psychosis, although not completely psychotic. There's a lot of insight there and um, also not quite psychotic, but very awkward thoughts, weird, intrusive thoughts um, that are bizarre. Um, and, uh, you know, I was in my life, I'd say these periods of this kind of severity sometimes lasted years historically in those states. Um, so I would I would say that you know my suffering I've got a a good um, handle on what it's like to be really messed up in terms of your mental health physical health they usually correlate as you know um, and uh, behaviorally um, and and more historically like in college addiction um, so I've been down the road in terms of what we call mental illness and. Um, you know, you, there's always worse, but I, I would say I was definitely on the spectrum of being extremely messed up for long periods of time in my life. Thanks. That's a that's a great start. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, a question that I think a lot of our listeners are probably asking or have asked themselves in the past. People who are dealing with suffering um, on a deep level like you were in the past who might be asking themselves, you know, when is the right time to make a phone call and get some care? How Can you walk us through that process for you the first time 
first time I made the phone call? Yeah. It's a good question. So I, uh, you know, I was, I was actually messed up as a kid, but I didn't have perspective then, you know, where I grew up in central New Jersey, I didn't know anyone, at least openly getting any form of mental health help, uh, at least openly. It was the eighties, um, in central New Jersey. I, I never even, I don't even, I kind of knew this concept of therapy and psychiatry, but in my world, that was not a thing, but I was definitely suffering from insomnia my whole childhood and severe social anxiety. And then the first time I got help was when I was 19. Uh, and I guess I'll just paint the picture real quick. What happened? I was, uh, it was my first psilocybin experience and I was alone in my dorm room and it was nighttime and I was on the 20, Second story, I believe, of a very tall high rise at UMass, um, University of Massachusetts. They have these high rises. And um, I got this wave of sort of feeling how disturbed I was, actually. Like it, it just sort of was like I knew it the whole time, but it was kind of like in my face of like how deeply disturbed I actually was feeling my whole life. And it was so overwhelming the disturbance. And it was also a physical disturbance, uh, that really grew inside of me that I just, I was like completely convinced I was going to jump out the window and, uh, go down as one of those people as we heard about decades ago, jumping out of buildings on LSD. And I thought I was, that's what was happening to me that night. Um, but, uh, I stopped myself, um, from doing that. It's just, the kind of takeaway I had there about the thing that held me get helped me get through the suicidal periods of my life was I just I just clung on to a person I loved in my in my mind and it happened to be my younger sister at that moment, which totally got me through the the at least the suicidal experience there and others in the future. But it got so overwhelming and I was so that's when all the symptoms I'm describing really came on fully for the first time. And at that point, it wasn't a choice of reaching out for help. At that point, it was a, um, it was a lifeline. Um, I would say I don't recommend waiting for a lifeline <laughs> to get help. Uh, you know, if anyone's struggling, um, I see it more as a growth path. We're all struggling uh, some days and some days we're doing great. And so I think it's just a path of growth. We can always be growing and healing um, I don't think we have to wait like I did until it became a life or death crisis. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of people it goes down for. But, you know, my encouragement would be to everyone that we can, we can be on a personal development path our whole life. Nice. You know, your description of the um, impulse to jump and, and that suicidal thinking on the mushrooms brings up for me this um, question mark. I'm curious what you think about this. You know, in, in psychedelic experiences, uh, some people interpret the intensity and the difficulty and the challenge and sometimes suicidal thinking, for example, as that the psychedelic is revealing something that was there um, or um, opening up uh, an opportunity to look at things, traumas from the past, that kind of thing. And then in conventional psychiatry, the way I was trained was, oh, this person's you know, having a drug-induced psychosis or a drug-induced um, manic episode. Or It's an interesting um, contrast between how people who seem to be more experienced with psychedelic psychotherapy would interpret the experience that you described versus conventional psychiatry. And I'm wondering when you look back with the, you know, more than 20 years of life experience between that event and today, how do you look back at that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. You and I have talked so much about psychedelic me medicine and, and, this question has been something you and I have chatted about a lot, right? And it's, um, so my, my framework 
Well, I'll first say, obviously, I'm a, I'm a very big fan of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy done properly. I'll say it that way. But um, I think that I think that it's not necessarily, I don't lean toward that it's in and of itself can induce schizophrenia. Um, it's like somehow a psychedelic, if you never took it, you probably would have never got schizophrenia. Um, I think that's probably unlikely. Of course, this is speculation, but I think more so I lean toward that it psychedelics are amplifiers of what's already happening in the system. And so when you have somebody like me and other people that have really severe histories of complex PTSD and probably already had a brain that's operating in a bipolarity spectrum, I think that it's, um, it's sensitive and delicate and that if psychedelic medicines are going to be used, it's just, they need to be used with caution in those cases. And, you know, I obviously, I had no idea how much psilocybin I took, um, or how much I should have taken. I had no one there to help me process. So my, more of my framework now is that, um, there's certain cases where psychedelic medicines aren't right. They're not right for every situation. Uh, and then the majority of people that probably get aggravated from psychedelic medicines, it was probably an issue of set and setting and dosage in my opinion now, um, more so than probably wasn't right for them. Um, but you know, it's case by case, but that's kind of my current thinking about it all. But I, you know, I think the psychedelic medicine conversation is really important, fascinating and fun. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's good to hear your, your current perspective. I know it's evolved a lot over the years and, um, you know, it also brings up for me that initial experience, you know, of making that phone call, as you described in a lifeline scenario of, you know, being presented with choices about, you know, I'm curious what that conversation was like with the uh, provider the first time, if you'd be willing to share that. Were you offered medication at that point or what happened there? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question, actually. Um, well, first I told my parents what was going on, which was really hard. I was very um, scared to tell them that I was suicidal and a total mess and a basket case inside myself. I was really afraid. So I told them eventually pretty quickly because it was, again, it was a lifeline situation. I was like, well, if I don't do something, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. Right. So, um, so then it was, it was interesting. Um, the first person I actually saw, uh, was a pharmacologist, um, who, uh, he didn't tell me exactly what he thought was going on with me, but you know, I got put on a really high dose of, uh, can't remember. It was an antipsychotic. He definitely thought I was, I, I was psychotic. Um, was I, I think it was I like was around then. I can't remember. Was I like around in the mid nineties? Yeah. It yeah. Seems, yeah. Yeah. So it was Zyprexa, uh, high dose. And, uh, and in two days, I got a hundred times more suicidal. I wow. was so messed up. And I was fighting throughout the entire day to just not kill myself. It was so bad. It got so amplified. Um, so fortunately, my own intuition was I can't go back to this guy. So I stopped the Zyprexa on day three. We found, and then my parents found another psychiatrist, met with him the first day, and I started uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy. Um, looking back, that's what it was. I didn't know at the time. Um, and he was a great guy. And, you know, um, interestingly, he put me on an antidepressant at the time, Paxil and a Benzo. Um, and I was loopy as hell. I was, you know, hypomanic all the time. Um, he probably, you know, back then they didn't have as much context around, as you probably know, around the sensitivity around the bipolar spectrum and antidepressants. And so I was, my social anxiety went to 
so, like so, social exhibitionism almost. Um, I was so open and loopy, and but uh, it took about four or five months, and I, I came out of that um, really scary time. But then I was a little loopy and hypomanic for about a year and a half on that uh, medicine. But I had a great first experience in psychodynamic psychotherapy. It was helpful. Um, and also in retrospect, I know now there's ways to speed up the process and not spend a year and a half in psychodynamic psychotherapy that I, I can see would have helped me in a month. I could have got out of what I got out of psychodynamic psychotherapy. Thanks for sharing that. It's it's helpful to hear about the challenges of, you know, the first go around with medication, what you face there. And it's such a common experience for people to to have serious side effects with medication. And it's hard to get right, you know, speaking from the other chair in the mm. room, so to speak, you know, from the right. psychiatry seat. Um, I can remember experiences where it's just like you hit the nail on the head and it's beautiful and you get a really good result with almost no side effects. And then for every one of those, you have, you know, half a dozen or a dozen partial, you know, bend the nail down with the hammer kind of experiences. <laughs> that's then a challenging more, more. job that you're in. <laughs> that you, you know, that's yeah. challenging, right? Yeah. Because you're, you're basically an artist over there, even though we call it 100% science. It's like with those numbers, that's not 100% science. Right, exactly. I mean, I can remember in probably who knows how many thousands of patients I've seen. I, you know, I remember with vivid clarity the handful of times it was almost perfect, you know, it was like right there on the first try. And, uh, and then, you know, so many experiences where it's a lot of tweaking and a lot of adjusting and a lot of working with side effects. And are we going to start another medication to deal with the side effect from the first medication or how are we going to, right get a result here and well, I'm glad and you're yeah I'm glad you're you're bringing that up it makes me think about myself you know I because I've been on many rounds of psychiatric medications for my life and uh it just makes me think about myself how like I feel like I'm a used car like a you know like a 1967 Ford like coming <laughs> in and it's like you got to bring it into the shop like five seven ten times a year to keep the thing going <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what my experience of psych meds were. It's like they did, they, they, they sort of got the car back on the road, but like three months later it broke down again. And it's like trying to analyze what happened and, you know, you're putting another bolt onto the engine. And I think, you know, my, from what I'd love to hear what you're saying, but I, I think what you're saying here is like complex psychiatry patients tend to be complex. They don't tend to be simple or they don't need to go to a psychiatrist. And it seems like it's actually a very challenging. Um, it's a very challenging treatment plan of just using medications. It, it's, it's a challenge to get it right. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, there's definitely an art to it. And uh, for sure, there's a lot of range in terms of people's experience and their um, effectiveness in working with medications as a tool and you know medications when they help people are amazing that they can be very helpful in suppressing the jagged edge of suicidality or other symptoms you know but um i i think one of the things that shifted for me about medication over the years is a, a shift in what i was what the goal was of what I was trying to do with people. Um, because as you know, the, the conventional training is that if the symptom disappears from the treatment, then you've got a successful treatment. Um, but what I started to see over the years was people who were kind of going through their lives suppressed. Um, the things that get suppressed are not only the symptoms, but other things like, um, joy and uh, creativity and expression and sexuality, sex drive is often very impacted by medications and so forth. So I'm, um, 
I'm wondering what was how you would describe, you know, the kind of pros and cons or the what the benefits and drawbacks really were for you over the years with medication. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, let me give a little context. Um, so, you know, I had this episode, I'll call it an episode at the time, that I got really sick when I was 19, probably lasted six, seven months, and then I was kind of a little hypomanic, like I said, for years. Um, but I was not well uh, during my 20s. I was still had chronic insomnia, still had chronic social anxiety, still had chronic agitation and anxiety and generalized anxiety uh, and had a low grade depression. And I didn't even know all this through my twenties, but it was there. It was pretty significant actually. So I wasn't well in my twenties. Uh, and then in my mid thirties is when I got really sick, um, for four years in my mid thirties. And now I'm 45. Um, so that's just a little context about this conversation about medication. Uh, so I think that medication, I wonder if I'd be alive, if medication wasn't psych medication, wasn't ever discovered. Um, I don't know. I, I may not be. So my first answer about psychiatric medications and the benefits is that I think they were one of the things that actually saved my life from me, uh, prematurely ending it. Um, because I, I think that they did have a role in sedating and suppressing my symptoms enough uh, at different moments in time that it gave me a window to ask bigger questions. Uh, and then, but I also know in terms of the drawbacks in my mid thirties, when I have my biggest run of medications, that, um, I'm finally almost off, off of all of them now, 10 years later. I'm still on an extremely low dose of a sleep medication that I am probably will be off of, I think, in the next few months. But what I learned about medications in that round was really different. Um, it was a constant, what you were talking about. It was like a tweaking process. I was really severely sick for four years with bouts of going into, you know, severity, a 10 on the scale of one to 10 to getting to like a five with medication and constantly tweaking that five, 10, five, 10. So, um, what I know now is that if I knew what I know now in terms of what actually caused my problems and what solves my problems, I imagine I wouldn't have needed them. But um, I did take them at a time and they helped slow things down enough for me to go look for more answers. But I'm also not convinced I'll never take a psych med again in the rest of my life because I, um, I don't want to be arrogant in that way. But um, I know so much more now about what actually caused my problems and the actual solutions that solve them. And it actually turns out at this moment in time, it's not psych meds that are solving my problems. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I'll need them again. I, um, they're there for me and other people, but turned out there were other things that actually solved the problems and psych meds weren't one of them. They just kind of reduced the problems for windows of time. Yeah, that's, I think that's well said, reducing the problems for windows of, of time. I think that's, I would say it's better than nothing, you know, getting a uh, reduction in symptoms for periods of time. But um, obviously it's not the kind of result that we would stand for or we would want to see with our clients today. Um, right. I'm wondering about, this is, this is a related topic and it, it keeps coming up in the back of my mind. So I want to see if you have any thoughts about this. Um, just around medication and diagnosis, you know, because you threw out in the beginning that there was a bipolar two diagnosis. Um, and then you mentioned complex PTSD. And I think as a psychiatrist, one of the things that's most difficult to 
discern sometimes is the difference between a presentation that's driven by complex developmental trauma versus a bipolar two condition. Right. And it's, it's not to say that they're always mutually exclusive either. I mean, you could have both, but I'm just wondering from your experience, how you relate to that or how do you parse those out in your mind? Yeah, such good questions. I'm well, first I'll say, let me throw out every diagnosis I've ever been labeled with <laughs> to start <laughs> the conversation. Good. So I've been and and I'll just say that any diagnosis I mentioned, I've been labeled on the severe spectrum of the diagnosis. So uh I've been labeled with OCD without uh without rituals. So you know, some called pure OCD. There's different words for that. So without compulsions. Um I've got a generalized anxiety diagnosis. I've got a dysthymia diagnosis. I've got an, a bipolar 2 diagnosis. I've got a cyclothymia diagnosis. I've got a complex PTSD diagnosis. I've got an, a... Um, I believe I got a psychotic diagnosis once that wasn't openly said to me. Um, yeah, I basically got every single mood disorder. <laughs> and um, I, it, it's just, to me, that's what's the fascinating part of the whole thing, which is that when, you know, and I, before I get into answering directly a question about, you know, PTSD versus diagnosis and also the usefulness of diagnosis is another part of it. Like, um, I've spanned every one um, in terms of I could fit into every thing in the DSM outside of really the psychotic disorders. And, and, and I, was fortunate and didn't fit into the personality disorders. Um, you know, just fortunate for myself that my personality didn't get highly injured. Um, so I was able to have the, you know, awareness to, to keep the ball moving forward on my healing really quickly. Um, but, you know, that's what the first thing I would say about the conversation is like, well, the DSM is, is um, a great idea in a certain way. But in practicality, when you have a, a patient that's not well and hasn't been well for a long time, you could tend to find them in almost all of those diagnoses at some point in their life. And so then what do we do? So that's the first thing I would say. I don't know if you have a comment about that. but Well, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're speaking um, a perspective that you know, a lot of people would associate Tom Insel's perspective with um, the former head of NIMH, who also was a provost at Harvard University. I mean, when he was head of NIMH, he was basically calling for throwing out the DSM because uh, there was so much overlap between symptoms from one condition to another that they didn't really, uh, they didn't hang together statistically as separate phenomena. Um, and I think the other critique that you and I have talked about a lot over the years is outside of PTSD, we really don't have in psychiatry any kind of orientation toward the cause of the symptoms. Um, we sort of relate to these as so-called biological illnesses, right? That OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, major depression, even panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, ADHD, these are all, so to speak, you know, brain disorders. Um, but the problem with that perspective, you know, which obviously we could get into, is it's, it's very reductionistic. And, you know, it implies that there's no uh, valid inquiry into what's underneath the symptoms. And I think that's, if, if you're a practitioner or if you're a a person who's getting psychiatric services, I think the conversation gets really interesting when you set that filter aside and you start actually opening your mind to the possibility that you could resolve your issue if you could get to the bottom of it. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, I think that um, I would say fortunately um, from the get-go, like yourself, I was exposed to a psychiatrist that was probably more into the psychotherapy than he was into the medications, even though he was good at that. Um, and so, 
generally speaking, the, the psychotherapists I've come across in my healing process, they don't hang their hat that much on the diagnosis. They're much more interested in what you're talking about, which is, well, okay, but let's actually figure out what's going on here. Um, so I was exposed to that, I think, early on. I think the benefits of diagnosis, though, which there are some, um, I could see that there's some benefits in, in kind of understanding. I mean, first of all, doing research on medications, there's benefits in diagnosis and also knowing like, okay, let's probably not give an antidepressant to someone on bipolar. I mean, as a general rule of thumb, like, um, like we, we know that there's like certain things be, that kind of constellate around these diagnoses that kind of point the way, um, I think as providers. Uh, in terms of thinking around interventions. But in terms of getting to the bottom of the causes, um, not just the interventions, but the actual causes and then what to do next, like they don't help that much, I don't think, at all. I mean, I can't say that all the seven or eight diagnoses I have that in the end of the day, that's anything about what my real problem was. Um, and, And actually figuring out the solutions. Solutions weren't really attached to the label. Um, I think that's the simplest way to say it at all. Like it wasn't even like, you know, bipolar, try a mood stabilizer. Like that's not what the solutions were for me. Those types of tools helped. But um, so I would say overall, the diagnosis didn't solve my problem. Um, but then you asked one other question, which I want to speak to, which is, well, what about trauma, right? And how do you differentiate between these diagnoses and trauma? And, you know, one thing I want to say about that is that, um, you know, we have PTSD, right, in the DSM-4, uh, 5. But complex PTSD to me is almost like potentially at the at, as one of the causes of almost all these conditions. Um, I haven't, I'll just say this, I haven't met many people that have been really sick that don't have complex PTSD, that don't have developmental trauma that happened over the course of time uh, to them. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying I, you know, I'm not going to meet someone that I'm just like, they're totally fine. There's one person I could think of that, in my entire time of, you know, not just myself working with thousands of people also, there's only one person I could think of where like it wasn't totally obvious of what happened in the childhood uh, system that would create a traumatic nervous system that might have influenced the brain to, to have these disorders. But anyway, so I would say, um, they're almost not separate for me. It's kind of like, I wouldn't call complex PTSD as a disorder. I would just cause it as like, it's one of the root causes of your problem. It's one of the root causes. Um, I don't even know that it's necessarily a disorder in the same way as like how the brain gets dysfunctional in these kind of categorical ways. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. It's a, it's a root cause without necessarily being, what I'm hearing you say, not determining a particular phenomenon, let's say. So for instance, a person with schizophrenia uh, may have childhood trauma that, you know, may be driving the expression of chronic psychosis, whereas a person with bipolar disorder could also have complex trauma as a component of what is manifesting. Um, Same thing with the anxiety disorders or depression. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I think that the way I look at it today, and this keeps evolving for me, but like, a, for instance, I mean, this is how I see myself. And so it's also the way I'm kind of viewing my philosophical framework at this point. Like, if someone sits down with me, I'm no longer saying like, does this person actually have bipolar? Or do they have complex PTSD? I'm no longer doing that because now I'm just saying, well, they're showing the symptomatic system of what we call the categories bipolar. Okay, yeah. but likely i know now likely there's a complex trauma in there that we also have to work through in addition to other things because they have this brain expression now um and 
just solving the complex trauma in and of itself probably won't be enough with somebody who has bipolar because the body is so imbalanced. So there's a lot of functional medicine that has to happen and other things. So for me, it's like they're, they're a little different. Yeah, I, I, that's similar to how I think about it. I, I've, I've told you know, many of my patients that, re- let's take, for example, trauma and bipolar Bipolar one, um, you know, telling people, look, I don't know if healing your trauma completely will fully resolve your bipolar disorder or your bipolar symptoms, but we might as well do it because we have the technology to do that. And if we can get a person in the right kind of effective trauma work, it may completely resolve it or at least reduce the expression of it um, enough to make it more manageable and, and for the person, you know, to become more empowered in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that we're too sensitive as a culture and especially in medicine around like um, being careful about telling people that they have trauma and like, you know, just, you know, and, and that most people have trauma, like that we're so careful about that. I think we're too sensitive there because first of all, it's like, what's the big deal? Like this is a, it's human beings. It's a fragile life experience and we all have undigested experiences. And if you get mentally ill in that process, to me, that means there's no way you're not traumatized if you're mentally ill. I mean, you'll just be traumatized just from the mental illness, let alone events that you're feeling are traumatic to yourself, but you can't get through a mental illness and not have trauma about the mental illness. I mean, I've, I've never met a person on the planet that went through severe mental illness and isn't just traumatized in and of itself just by the mental illness. So to me, they're inseparable, um, mental illness and trauma. They're inseparable. And um, I think we just have to grow up and realize like, let's help people digest their experience and digest the parts of their experience that were overwhelming to them, which is all my own. That's my framework on trauma. And uh, we're going to have one step closer to helping mentally ill people. There's other components as we both know, but it's a big one. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it's a nice segue into coming back to your journey of healing in psychiatry and the decision that you made at some point to look for an integrative provider and not work in the conventional model anymore. And I wonder if you, be willing to share what that was like and what, how you went through that process of making that choice. It's also a really good question because, you know, I, so the other thing that happened at age 19 is I got sent on a spiritual journey right at that moment on that psychedelic journey. So not only was I really messed up, but I also got extremely sp- spiritual in my life. Uh, and so I was already in my twenties, you know, trying all kinds of things, um, different diet things. And of course, like in the meditation traditions and all kinds of stuff. And then in my thirties, when I got really sick again, um, and we could talk about what triggered that, that could be useful too. But when I got really sick again, um, I was doing a lot of stuff on my own, um, you know, again, with diet and some supplements and things like that. Um, but I was so, I didn't even realize that I wasn't really open to finding the answers at that point in time. I was spinning my wheels and not, not calling in the helpers that I, that could have propelled my journey quicker. Um, I was, I think that I believe now that we, we, we intuitively will attract the helpers that we need at any given point in time. And that as we wake up to the possibility that there's a deeper level of healing, if we're willing to change our behavior and change the way we think, all of a sudden we'll attract in the next level of healer. So it actually wasn't until my mid to late thirties that I was even ready to recognize that I could change the way I was thinking about this whole thing. Up until that moment in time, I was still stuck in the thing of why am I this way? Like, I'm unique. What I'm going through, no one can tell me what's going on exactly. All the way till my mid to late 30s. And then all of a sudden, I started 
pushing myself and challenging myself to not believe that, that no one could tell me what's going on with me. Um, that, you know, I'm not that unique, um, that there are people out there that actually could probably tell me what's going on. As soon as I opened to that, then all of a sudden I finally started attracting in that next level of healers. And there were some key healers at that point, doctors and coaches and throughout the whole spectrum of healers that all of a sudden I got the answers that I was waiting for my whole life. Once I actually opened to the fact that people had the answers, they're out there. Um, they, they could help me understand my puzzle um, that was going on. And that's when it started happening. Um, and that's how I opened up to like, for instance, an integrative psychiatrist when I was like, this is, I can't spend my whole life this way. I don't want to. I, I have so much I want to accomplish. I think the one other thing I'll say here is that my reason for getting better got bigger than it ever was. And that, that's the second thing that changed. I knew I wanted to have a child and I knew I couldn't be the father I wanted to be, how sick I was. I also knew that I wanted to help people in a much more global way and, and run a business to do that. And I knew I couldn't accomplish that, how sick I was. So those two reasons got so big in my mind that then I had a big enough reason to change my perception of what was possible. And then all of a sudden, all the people I ever needed showed up in my life within months. And, uh, and then the growth curve of healing was, went down to just a few, two to three years versus decades. Wow. <laughs> Powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got so many questions from what you were just sharing. It's hard to choose which uh, path to go down. But one piece that I think is so powerful here is basically, you know, making a decision that you were going to, the word that keeps coming up in my mind is responsibility. Like you, you took responsibility for achieving the fullest expression of who you could be. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm putting it that way because one of the challenges that I've encountered over and over again with my patients as a psychiatrist is the, the challenge that comes with the diagnosis. It's, it's almost like, okay, I have bipolar. Oh, okay. I have PTSD. And, and there's, and there's oftentimes there's an implied limitation inside of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, um, I don't want to, um, I don't want to collaborate, uh, with someone unconsciously to basically message them that their life is going to be limited by the mental health challenges that they face. Um, and I guess the word I'm looking for is colluding with people to, basically say, you know, you're always going to be limited. You're never going to be able to run because you broke, in your, you broke your leg one time. You're never going to be able to run as fast as the next person or that kind of messaging. And I'm wondering, you know, this, this choice that you made, this taking this bigger stand for your future, was that something that ever came up in the care that you were receiving or was that something that more came from inside of yourself? I think it's um, both. Um, I think that the, the trick when, when someone's been suffering for decades, when they're on the moderate to severe end of psychiatric illness... I think the trick here is that when you're in those states, um, every moment feels like an eternity. It's kind of like what we talk about as like a bad psychedelic experience. It's like where you don't, there's no part of you that believes it's ever going to end. There's because it feels so eternal and boundless in those states. And um, the, it's sort of like this inner torture that you're sort of doing everything in your mind to try and ninja your way away from the pain because it's so 
overwhelmingly incredible and you're constantly just trying to do things in your mind to to sidestep. And it's just every time you sidestep, you're right back at the pain. But it's like this circle of just constantly running in a cage. And so to break that state, which a lot of people are in, right? As you know, a lot of people get to that place and they stay there sometimes for years and often for months. And again, one moment feels like an eternity. So that's intense, right? So to break the state and to recognize um, that there's another possibility um, about how to approach this thing. I mean, for me, it was definitely a combination of an inner voice of inspiration. To answer your question, it was an inner voice of inspiration, which I always um, had which was like, I always knew that my mission in the world was far more important than my neurotic and psychotic, so to speak, processes. I always knew my mission was actually more important than what I was sucked into. So, so I was able to listen to that. But I would also say that um, there were just certain people and their methods that allowed me, and I would almost call them more coaching methods that allowed me to crack the code on those, um, at least those profound states of suffering to get into a empowerment in myself where it was like, I'm going to spend my whole life dealing with this. I don't care anymore. I'm going to deal every day. I'm going to wake up and deal. I think it was also the coaching kind of space people that I started following that helped me crack that code um, to get empowered enough to care that when I woke up, I don't care if I feel like absolute hell and torture and I'm going crazy. I'm, I'm still going to look for the next solution. Yeah, it's um, this is probably another conversation for another time, but I just think it's so interesting that psychiatry in terms of how we think about it or conventional psychiatry uh, we think of as dealing with symptoms and just getting rid of symptoms and then we put thriving and um, empowerment and you know being fully expressed in the world and so forth as we put that in the coaching realm <laughs> yeah and I just think it's such an interesting uh, delineation Um that you know, yeah. psychiatry basically, we think of it as not addressing any of those things, which is, I think, very sad. Actually, it is. Well, you know, it's interesting, right? Because psychiatry and uh, psychology um, was completely based on pathology, basically, mostly until the eighties. I mean, there was other traditions that came up, like Gestalt and things, but they were most. It was mostly just based on pathology, but then. Psychiatry didn't actually shift that much. Psychotherapy had a bit of a shift with positive and optimal psychology movements that started then. And, and looking for like what is actually potential. But it actually didn't even take hold that much in psychotherapy either. There was a wave there, and it's definitely talked about. Um, but it's not... I still believe when I talk to, you know, when I study a lot of what's going on in the psychotherapy space, and you and I obviously know a lot about the psychiatry space with our institute, but there's not a lot of talk about what's the potential of the person sitting in front of you. It's, it's not typically the conversation. Um, how do you achieve potential? And you're right. That's the conversation in coaching. Um, in the coaching space. Like people often ask me, what's the difference between coaching and therapy? Well, one of the main differences for me is that in the coaching space, the coaching space is talking about what is this person's potential? What is this person's potential? The psychotherapy spaces tends to be more of either a process space or how do we get them functional, functionality, um, self-discovery, um, but it doesn't tend to predominate the space. How do we get this potent person reaching higher and higher and higher levels of potential across the, their entire life lifeline? Like, how do we give them the tools so they keep reaching the next level of potential? And, you know, I think that's sad. I think that um, it's not just sad, but I, I think it's something where we can grow in these fields. 
getting this into a human potential movement. And, and that's obviously what you and I are trying to do, but um, it needs to happen. Absolutely. And, you know, it's obviously, it's also a cultural um, issue that the um, sort of, I would, you know, we tend to talk about it like um, in terms of uh, growth mindset or, or growth mentality that life is about being challenged and facing the challenges and finding the resources to overcome the challenges and to grow throughout the entire lifespan. Um, the idea that the mind, well, that the brain is plastic throughout the lifespan. So, and this, this whole idea of like life as a journey of growing and learning and falling down and, you know, dusting off your knees and continuing on. And it's, it's not something that, uh, I encountered as a kind of cultural phenomenon in, in, in how we live in America, you know? And so I think it's a, to, to, to couch life, let's say, or health. Let's talk about health for a minute. Like health is the absence of pain. Is that true? Like, I think that's how we in conventional medicine, not even just psychiatry, but conventional medicine, it's like, well, health is the absence of symptoms. It means, you don't have a pain, you don't go to the doctor. But, you know, we know that that's not what health is. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, well, you're bringing up a really good sort of segue for me in the story, because it's like, you're making me kind of reflect on that. Um, I always wanted to sort of keep seeing what I was capable of. Okay, so that was just one thread of my life. Like I had that in me. But another thread in relationship to my suffering was how do I just feel better? How do I just feel better and get rid of the suffering? Um, and, and that's what you're describing as health. How do we get the absence of pain? Um, and I got to say that um, I failed that one. I never succeeded at that, um, which was having an absence of pain <laughs> and suffering. Uh, and I finally stopped trying and that was the next thing that I think that helped me propel forward in my journey was when I stopped trying and approaching it that way. Um, you know, that was a big shift for me when I stopped, you know, when the, when there was a new kind of flare up internally. Um, and I would say this is only three, four years ago when I was really able to practice this and, and have it work. We would do this flare up and I'm starting to get crazy and feel out of my body and just nuts and, you know, normally just the symptoms coming on, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this who's ever suffered from severe symptoms. It's like terror just starts coming on and start tripping out like, oh my God, it's here again. It's What do I do? How do I fix this? When I finally stopped doing that with myself um, and knowing that um, I'm going to suffer, that's a part of life. But now what? <laughs> Okay, so I'm in this experience. Now what do I do? Like versus, you know, the panic of like, how do I get rid of the pain as fast as possible? Yeah, that was a major shift. And I would agree. I think that um, although there has been some benefits to uh, allopathic medicine pursuing that approach with different types of conditions, there have been benefits to... Um, you know, abolishing symptoms overnight. Um, I think we also have, uh, we also see that a lot of people, not just mental health wise, are very sick on the planet. We've done decently in medicine, but not that great in terms of people's quality of life. And I think that this is, this is a philosophical issue in medicine that you're pointing out and mental health care uh, specifically is like, if we keep taking this approach, we're going to find ourselves realizing that we're in pain the day later. Um, when we just abolished one pain, a new pain's right back at our face. And that's just a, um, a cycle of using medicine your whole life that's actually has consequences to use it that way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's a philosophy of how you're using the medication. And I think the metaphor for mental health care providers of, of surgery and using medication as anesthesia so that the actual surgery can happen um, 
and you don't have a patient who's jumping off the table because you're using a scalpel without anesthesia is actually a pretty useful metaphor in my practice. So failing to relieve pain is a huge mistake. And, you know, as you shared, I think so vulnerably, you know, you could be dead today if somebody didn't step in and help you relieve pain. But when we use anesthesia, you know, we wheel people back to the OR and then we give them anesthesia and then we don't do the surgery and they come out of the OR and they think that they're well because they got anesthesia, but there was no surgery. That's also a mistake. And so I think both, you know, it's sort of like both aspects and the the art really in medicine of balancing, supporting the person adequately to face what they need to face, but challenging them at the same time, which again is something that we don't really think about or not something I heard about in medical school. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think it takes a certain level of maturity to recognize that psychological challenge and emotional challenge, physical challenge, um, to high levels sometimes like that, that actually can benefit us in our life and that we actually need that to grow. Um, and, and, and for that to be a living experience, not just an intellectual concept or that's fine. One day we're like a little challenge, like, Oh yeah, this is, this is a good challenge for me mentally. But then the next day, you know, we're like banning our partner out of our house in our head because we don't want the challenge. Right. So it's like, I think it's, um, it's a maturity process, I think, and it's a necessary one of being a human of that, um, not mental illness, but psychological challenge is a part of flexing the psyche to expand and grow and learn life's curriculum. And it's necessary. Um, and the more we can embrace that, the quicker we can understand when things go um, when things get too disordered and disorganized in our systems about how to bring it back into a more higher state of order. But we're always going to have challenge and uh, we're always going to have bad days and bad hours and bad minutes where we're like, ah, this is so damn hard and I want it so bad to go away. We're always going to have that. Um, but it's like, I think what I've learned is, well, what position are you going to take with that for the rest of your life? Because it's coming tomorrow. So what position are you going to take? When that happens again, what are you going to try to take? What's your intention? Because we're not always going to do it, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that kind of leads into another area that I think has been such a rich conversation for you and me over the years, which is not just what position are you going to take, but also what lens are you going to wear as you face the challenge or the suffering? And for example, do you take a functional medicine lens to the suffering? Do you take a psychological lens to the suffering? Do you take a lifestyle medicine perspective about the suffering? There's so many different ways to relieve the suffering. Um, but there's also a lot of different root causes, I would say. So I'm, I'm curious your perspective and your journey around that. The first thing I would say here is that what I learned is that it tends to be the thing we're rigid around that helps us. The thing that we don't want to do. Um, <laughs> like, I don't yeah. want to take psych meds. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe in functional medicine. Um, you know, it's like, yeah. it, I don't believe in, uh, you know, going from a vegetarian diet to an animal protein diet. Like, it tends to be, in my experience now, from what I'm seeing, there's ways we're rigid in our life and we're not willing to try other things based on ideologies. And in, in my experience, actually it's, it's that rigidity and, and the, the things that we haven't tried is where the healing is. We've tried the other things, anything we're telling ourselves is going to work. I mean, that's the, that would be one other thing I would say to this is like, if we're telling ourselves this thing we've been trying for two, 20 years is going to solve the problem. And the problem is only, 10 or 20% better, it's not going to solve the problem. 
you'd be lucky if you get another five percent out of that method. So, I think that um, all these things are important. Um, I found I think it's a constitutional thing. I think for me, it happened to be. For the most part, it was a lot of evidence-based things that worked for me. There's some evidence, but there's some things that there's no evidence that I've done. Like an example is uh, intergenerational trauma. Uh, I can only say I believe, I can't say I know, but I could say I believe I had a, a really high level of intergenerational Jewish trauma and that uh, it was you know, 40, 50 somatic experiencing sessions just on uh, Holocaust trauma that maybe it was 40 sessions. And I believe it was a massive part of my healing, but there were many others. Um, but, you know, when I was 28 or 30, like I had no, I was like, no, I like maybe, I was like more like maybe that's the thing, but I'm not going to focus on that. So I think it's something about, um, you know, being realistic, not just doing things that are completely woo-woo forever. And it's if it's giving you results, keep doing it. But, you know, if you go try something that's, you know, very esoteric and not much is happening in a month or two months, I don't think it's going to happen in a year. Like, to me, what I found is like the functional medicine was a big lever for me, but um, made a, a big lever for me. But like those things started working and like, uh, you know, one to two, three months, I started seeing big results. And the only other thing I would say there is you got to make sure you have a qualified provider because it, like you just, like you were describing earlier, it's an art form and you could get lost in somebody who you think is qualified for years, but you're not getting radically better. Well, if you still believe in the system, go try someone else um, mm -hmm. in that system. And that could be, Conventional psychiatry, even I've had multiple conventional psychiatrists, and a couple of them in my early thirties didn't couldn't get it right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's any any discipline, right? Right, and you know that's exactly, and that's why they call it medical arts because it's a practice, and there's no uh, cookbook, especially in psychiatry, you know, for what the right combination is for this particular person because. The bipolar two presentation, for example, among others, uh, is really different for each person. And so, what combination does that person need? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely an art to it. And I appreciate what you said about opening your mind to other frames. If the frame that you're in isn't producing the results, um, that's interesting. That once you opened your mind to some functional medicine approaches, you started getting results. It sounds like pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the framework you and I created and, and you know, in our institute and we, do we teach in our clinics, like I believe that the framework we've created is a very wide framework in terms of the amount of people that could enter that framework, follow that framework, and get benefits quickly. I think it's, it's a very... Um, wide net framework but it's not for everyone um but i do believe that there are there are a few essential things anybody that's pretty mentally sick that they should be checking out pretty deeply i think functional medicine is absolutely one if and but you need a skilled provider there's a lot of people in any medicine tradition that's not skilled enough so you need a skilled provider in mental health and functional medicine, right? Um, I think that's one. Um, and then I think that, uh, you know, nutrition is a huge lever that uh, is overlooked. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, obviously just all the psychological sciences is big too. I mean, I, I think those three things in and of themselves, um, and then in the psychological sciences, I would include coaching. Um, because I think you need good coaches uh, to help you with the stuff we were talking about. So, but if you've got a, you know, if you had a team and you're not doing well and you're dealing with the functional medicine and the supplements, you're dealing with the psychological stuff, whether it's trauma and a coach and, and then you're dealing with your diet 
and your behavior in your life, which will follow. But um, you do those, I think most people can get better. Um, not everyone, because there's always unique situations that there's, you know, these sub disciplines that you got to look at. But I think that that overview from what I've learned uh, and what I've seen with my, you know, clients is that most people can get better under that. Yeah, we we definitely have a broad um, basis of areas that we look at in terms of how to get lasting results or empowerment um, with people as we support them. There are some things that we don't include, which I think we, at least my position would be that they're also valid, but they're just outside the scope of what we teach, like acupuncture or uh, natu- naturopathic um, approaches or homeopathy or things that can be very effective for certain people. And I've known people who've gotten great results um, from those yeah. things. But um, yeah, I think the important message that I'm hearing from you, which I agree with, is be open-minded and um, and get empowered and learn about all the different things on the menu that could help you. And don't get stuck in in kind of a, a disempowered relationship with the provider you're working with and really relying on them to tell you what could be effective for you. Um, obviously, they probably, hopefully, will have very valuable information for you. But to think that they have the answers for you is just, a, I think, a very um, disempowered position to put yourself in. Yeah, I think... Um before even thinking about the modality, uh, you got to make sure that you're with a provider. Like, uh, you know, when I tell people that I work with now, and you know, I don't work with a lot of people anymore, but like, if they're not hearing things they've never heard before and feeling things they've never felt before, like, I'm not the right guy for them. Like, to me, it's like, when you find a provider that is working at the next level of where you're trying to get to, like they're going to start telling you things that like, Oh, finally someone's saying that to me. Like no one's said it to me this way before. Um, and, and you know, there's a clear path and you're going to see results, um, progressively over time. Um, when we're stuck in symptom cycles for years, it's time, in my opinion, it's time to go find a new provider. Um, because like, why not? Like you want to just stay in symptom cycles for the next five years and you've been in them for five years. Like to me, it's like, okay, that, it, that provider got you where they could. And now you're needing something new that a new provider has to offer you. So I think it's a big part of the conversation is the provider. And it's not about better providers or worse providers or right or wrong. It's just like, the level of healing that you need, there's a certain person out there that's right for you at that moment in time. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you know, in my own journey, I've met providers who helped me for a certain period of time and then it was time to move on. So I, I, I totally relate to what you're saying and, you know, agree with you. Yeah. It's interesting how people sometimes I think, and I, you know, I've had this experience with, um, both being on the receiving and the giving end. There's a, there's sometimes there's a, a sense of sort of stagnation or a sense of comfort that arises just from the familiarity of having a person who cares about you. And, um, but there can be a, a kind of a, a plateau in recovery that, you know, sometimes people get, I think a little too comfortable in that and um, are not being maybe challenged enough to go to the next level. Totally. Totally. And, um, you know, I think that's a big uh, thing, like as a provider to try and not take things personally. And like, if there's a plateau and, you know, it's like time to send them off to the next person and push and push that. If you feel like you don't have a ton more to offer, it's like I've, there's always going to be people that I would have to do that with, just even with I, what I know now. There's always going to be a time where it's like time for the person to go to the next person. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I think that's relevant for sure. Um, I'm, 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 I'm thinking 
uh, that it would be exciting to spend a little more time on psychedelics because um, <laughs> you brought it up and uh, you know, it's, it's uh, such a ma- major part of the conversation right now in mental health and at least in more of the innovative space of like, well, you know, what's coming and what's the role. And I'm just, I think it might be nice to spend five minutes or so on that. What do you think? It sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah. Where should yeah. we start with that? Um, well, I guess um, the first thing I'd like to say about psychedelics is that, um, well, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. I, I'm a true believer in the potentials and the possibilities here with psychedelics. And at the same time, you know, having practiced psychiatry for 20 years and seen, you know, um, promised, uh, advances after promised advances after promised advances, um, I come with a, a certain level of sobriety or, um, kind of, I'd like to call it maturity. I don't, I don't want to sound jaded, but I think that, um, there's a, a hype that arises whenever there's a new tool that's on the way, you know, and people get on the bandwagon and they get, you know, a little carried away and inflated sometimes about what can happen with a particular tool. And, you know, it's like, Oh, we finally have the tool. We finally have the tool. So I think it's important for us to talk about, you know, how we think about the right way to hold this tool and um, to sort of bring it into balance. So it's not really um, perceived as a panacea or something that can fix every problem under the sun. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I guess I'll say a little bit about, you know, the relevancy in my experience of what I went through um, in my life around mental illness and um, the role of psychedelics. Um, I think like you're saying, there's a lot of hype. And I think we hear a lot of the voices of individuals that are expressing how much psychedelics have helped them. And we also see some great research coming out. Um, uh, but the more like popular media, we hear voices of a lot of right now. There's a, there's a stage because of the positive research for a lot of individuals that have benefited from psychedelics and we're healing a lot from them right now. And I, I guess what I would say is, you know, I've seen that and I've also seen in my practice a lot of people that um, psychedelics, they don't look at it that way in their own life. And they look at it as like, gosh, that was something I don't want to have to go through again. Um, so me personally, like I said, the 19-year-old story, I've probably done, uh, I haven't done a psychedelic outside of a, you know, a ketamine experience, a medical ketamine experience, which that's a different story, which you know about what's amazing. Um, I haven't done a psychedelic in 10 years outside of that experience. Um, and uh, my, I've probably done 40 or 50 times psychedelics prior to that. Um, so for some people, you know, have never done a psychedelic, that's a big number, right? Substantial amount of experiences, yeah. And for people who have done a lot of psychedelics, that's like grade school, <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe you're just a beginner for the Burning Man crowd. It's like I'm not even a beginner, right? It's like I, I'm just, they're just giving me my white belt right now. So, um, uh, what I will say for me is that, you know, my, my, most of my psychedelic experiences prior to 10 years ago was with ayahuasca and, um, uh, that, uh, was always a, a, a love hate affair for me. Um, every time, um, I hated almost every minute of it and I, loved it that I wanted to come back for more. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of brutal. It was like, I, it was like every time it was like my most inner torturous experience I could imagine. And something about it was so intriguing. And I thought that if I keep returning to it in the setting that I was doing it, 
that that it was I, I would get through what was going on and um the context of what i was doing it in though it turns out for me um i got really sick mentally as i kept doing it more and more um that it's not the ayahuasca i, I want to say that it, um it, it's that one it's probably not the right medicine for me number one uh at all and uh, two, it wasn't the right dose and it also wasn't the right setting and I didn't have a therapist and all that combined, um, you know, it ended up really destabilizing me. That's the first thing I would say there. I don't know if you have any comments about that part of it, but. Well, just a clarification for our audience. I've, I've, you know, been close to you through your journey. So I know some of these details, but tell us about the set and setting. Were you, um, ordering ayahuasca on the internet and drinking it at the <laughs> kitchen table or <laughs> what, was, yeah, the, right. Good what was the context? Well, I had a great set and setting in a certain way. Uh, I'm saying it wasn't the right set and setting for me, but I did it all ritualistic in, uh, in communities that, um, spiritual communities, churches, ayahuasca churches, uh, I, and, um, you know, 30 people in a room with a shaman and helpers and, um, you know, rituals, and prayers and songs and all that stuff. And I did in, you know, in Colombia, I was in Colombia twice and was in the jungles there with, you know, 90 year old shamans. And um, so in a certain way on the outside, you would go, oh, that's the right set and setting, right? <laughs> like that right. would probably yeah. be the initial response there, right? Qu qualified shaman, uh, right. relatively uh, traditional ceremony, that kind of thing. Right. Right, but it turned out two things for me of what happened there for me. Now, one thing I want to why I want to give credit to ayahuasca is that it got me, it highlighted what was wrong with me enough that I actually got pointed in the right direction. Um, I don't know if I could have done that with those without those journeys. On the flip side, I got really, really sick and ill. Um, by doing that much ayahuasca um, in the set and setting in the way I was doing it. So um, for me, the um, what was not going on that ne I needed was, number one, I needed a therapist there the whole time with me. That's the first and foremost thing, right by my side. Because when I take psychedelics in general, I feel an extraordinary amount of trauma in my mind and in my uh, in my body. And so I don't, you know, certain people can just work with the medicine to let it heal them. And that's real, um, without another body there, even my particular blend of trauma was about going into an internal state of social isolation and isolation in my mind from my particular blend of trauma. So for me, that set and setting was like, traumatizing on steroids because I needed social engagement to deal with my trauma, uh, mm. even on the medicine. I couldn't just let the medicine do its work because I needed social engagement because my wound was around social isolation inside myself. Um, so, you know, that's the first thing I would say, you know, and I also am a slow metabolizer. So I was taking about five times as much as I needed. Um, and so, you know, I, my dose was always like what well, people were having, you know, six, seven doses in, I'm like, what's going on here? It's just that I'm a slow metabolizer. I don't think there's any other big story there. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, there was all that. Clarification question. Um, and this is really sort of a speculative question and there's no right answer here for anybody, but I've always wondered with ayahuasca, how much of the trauma material that comes up on ayahuasca is personal and how much of it is transpersonal or intergenerational or, you know, in the field, even in the circle of say 30 people working with a shaman. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's such an important question that we can't obviously know, but what I would say is that uh, that's the question we need to be asking ourselves all the time in trauma work, which is like, is any of this intergenerational trauma? And if it is, if it's not um, only about the experiences of this lifetime, um, 
what do we do about that to not create too strong of a story um, that we start clinging to and attaching to, but to be able to work with the energy in a conducive way. So I would say that my experience is that it's very easy to access intergenerational experiences on, uh, on medicines like that. Um, but we also have to be careful not to create huge stories after of, you know, now I'm the sixth reincarnation of blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I just saw, you know, uh, a soldier that cut my head off, like, okay, maybe, but, um, I think we just have to be mindful in ourselves around creating narratives that are super strong and fixated. But I would say that my intuition without knowing for sure is that a lot of intergenerational material comes up on these medicines. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of information in any case. Um, wherever we decide to hang our hat on where you know where it's coming from, it's a lot of information. But you know, it's good information because it points us in directions of of modalities of healing. Whether or not these things are one hundred percent true, it sort of doesn't matter. It's like uh, you know, the, the first time I, I didn't so believe in it. But the first time I was up on this Holocaust trauma of mine was when I was 21 on an LSD journey. And for about half hour, I was just seeing swastikas everywhere. And I was so terrified and overwhelmed by it. I didn't say anything. And, you know, it was the first insight for me of pointing the road of like, yeah, things that happened 70 years ago where I wouldn't be here. Um, if that kept happening, uh, you know, and w eradicated almost my entire tribe, almost my entire tribe, um, that, uh, you know, that that doesn't have an impact on my psychology. Like, yeah, it's pretty obvious it does. And it took a little LSD to start to point that in that direction. Yeah. But I'm also not necessarily advocating here, go try all these different medicines, you know, not only just because they're illegal, but it's like, I, I am actually much more now conservative in my approaches to healing because I've learned yeah. from some of my mistakes. So I'm pretty excited about, let's take our time here. Let's see what comes out of the research. Um, you know, that's why I'm a really big fan of ketamine for particular uses because we've got some research to stand on and, and we're seeing some great results. And like, let's just be patient. We're going to have some research very soon on MDMA. We're going to hopefully it shows promising research and becomes a legal use for certain indications. And I'm like, let's just be patient. It's these things are coming. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, when we were speaking a few minutes ago about, you know, it's, it's good information regarding ayahuasca. I think um, it's also worth balancing that comment with the perspective that, you know, that I've, kind of grown into with my background with MDMA research and following along the the research on psilocybin and more of the historical research on LSD that there's um, there's certain medicines that are probably not the best for certain people you know and um, as we become more knowledgeable through research and through shared clinical experience I think we're going to have a much more accurate and kind of sharpened perception about, you know, which medicine might be a better fit for which person. And yeah, so exactly. uh, we can live inside of this more nuanced zone between kind of like the, the, the psycho knot end of the spectrum of like, everybody should be trying everything and more of the, you know, uh, conventional maybe, end of the spectrum of, or conservative end of the spectrum. Nobody should ever do any of these drugs because they're going to hurt you every time. Right, right, which is where we've been, right. um, at least uh, across our culture. But yeah, and, and I think you're right. It's like, you know, we're going to have guys like you who are like all up on the research, you know, you know, it's still an art form, but it's like these are medicines, just like the rest of the medicines available to us. And um I think they need to be viewed as medicines. You know, sure, they have this extra component that's so fascinating about how it interrupts the psyche and um, 
that's amazing. But they're medicines and they're chemicals, whether they you know aren't synthesized or they are synthesized. Um, they're still medicines in my mind, um, and they have a they have a purpose for people, and sometimes they don't have a purpose for people. That's going to really help them. Yeah, I mean, I've I've certainly seen my fair share of people who are traumatized by. Um, using psychedelics and not only in a quote unquote recreational context, um, people coming out of ayahuasca retreats in South America and taking a year to get back to finding their footing, um, or more. Right. Um, but I've also seen incredible openings and, uh, deepenings, um, that were, you know, inconceivable for people who, had never used psychedelics before. Um, so, you know, it's just like one of those conversations in mental health where we, there's no right answer, but there, there are nuances for us to pay attention to in ways that we can mitigate risks and um, try to tilt the movement toward healing and away from further damage or further trauma. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if we talk about ketamine for a moment too, so, you know, we've, obviously there's all these psychedelics that, you know, people are recreationally using or, or spiritually using, or, you know, on their own. And, um, again, like I've seen it all, like, just like you, like the person who comes back and is really in a different place. And the person who comes back from those experiences and is, in a much worse, harder place, and more challenged that takes a long time to unravel. And, but, but when I think about ketamine, since that's the one psychedelic that we can medically use right now, um, you know, I think that, uh, and, and from my experience um, of doing that intervention, um, you know, I think we've, it's, it's, it's an incredible tool. Um, it seems to be, most appropriate right for very depressed people um and, and very stuck people uh ruminative people and um and there's other things it also seems to be somewhat useful for trauma like you can get into some deep trauma therapies with it it's it's pretty fascinating that way um and so to me, like when I see something like that, what, what excites me is that we're now finally at a moment in history in this country where we can control the set and setting at such a high level, like with ketamine, we can control dosing. We can even do IV ketamine where we're like, we could turn the volume down. If it was, if it's like blasting people into so much overwhelm, now we can turn it like that. Now we're at the point or or turn it off. Right. So we're now at the point where we've got a set and setting where we can have a therapist at a person's side. We can, um, you know, we've got an agent that actually has a biological impact on people's brains. That's really quite profound sometimes. And we've got a control mechanism. So to me, like we are um, way beyond where we've been uh, in the last 50 years with psychedelics. Um, You know, we had the chaos of the 60s with psychedelics and, um, you know, that didn't turn out that well overall. I mean, it was great and it caused a revolution. Part of it did. There was other things that caused a revolution, but there was also some fallout. But now we're like, we're going slower now. And I love how like ketamine is a great example of when we really adhere to the medical protocols well, we're way more likely to produce a positive response. And that's, that's my hope of how, as these new medicines hopefully uh, come to pass, that we stay responsible. Uh, and we keep the controls in place so that we're really limiting, you know, and, and helping people experience challenge that they can actually do something about and not just have challenge that's going to blow them out of their body. And they can't do anything about it, but except, you know, try and integrate it later because, you know, hopefully we don't have those all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was this, uh, more manic period in the sixties, I would say, Timothy Leary and, you know, the notion that everyone, you know, psychedelics are good for everybody and we should be, you know, spiking people's drinks with LSD without their knowledge and all that kind of crazy business. And 
but in the background, there were these very determined and um, methodical researchers like Stan Groff and, you know, uh, William Richards and um, people who were kind of behind closed doors doing, doing the work, you know, and yeah. figuring out like what is set and setting and how does it work and what works well and what doesn't. And um, I feel so much um, gratitude and just humble regard for these giants who came in front of us and really laid a path down for, you know, successful uh, treatments with psychedelics. Yeah. And yeah. It's, uh, it's exciting that their work is finally coming, you know, Roland Griffiths at Hopkins and, you know, the, the work is coming forward uh, to be accessed um, hopefully in short order by, you know, millions of people. So yeah, it's a, it's an exciting time. It's a really exciting time. And, uh, it's a, it's just an exciting time for, for some new medicines really, um, to get to the, to the public and, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that the medicine's not the treatment, right? The psychotherapy is the treatment. So, exactly. um, it's an exciting time to pair the medicine with the treatment because <laughs> that's not yeah. what's been done. And sure, some people got it without it. You know, they got it just by the medicine or they had a space holder. But I'm excited about now as these come come along here of like, well, let's pair these two things and now we're going to see some healing. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a different use of pharmacology. It's a yeah. um, catalytic, uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a disruptor. Um, kind of use, big time, which is just very different in terms of what we were talking about earlier today about you know antidepressants and suppressing and kind of more mild anesthesia, uh, which isn't so much about disruption; it's about um, smoothing things over. So, yeah, and it's a great you know I, I'm glad you're bringing it there as we kind of wrap up on the psychedelics. It's a great framework, which is there are times to suppress, right? Uh, right. You know, we want to suppress a psychosis, right? Like, we don't want to uh, amplify a psychosis, right? Um, so, so it's like it's good you're bringing it here because it's like there's a there's a role for suppression and there's a role for expression, but um, the the psychedelics are going to express um, what's going on, and uh, there's a time and place for that, you know, and um, but it's not a one stop shop, obviously. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's when is the right tool, uh, going to be picked for the right application. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, including the suppressive therapies, as you say, um, you know, which we still use a lot and recommend in our fellowship education and, you know, in, inside of our clinics, um, yeah. there's absolutely a role for that and need for that. Until there's something better. There is. Right. Right. Maybe one day we'll discover some thing that can suppress something quicker and more effective and with less side effects. Hopefully we do. Because there's just a role for suppression. I mean, there's that's all it's about, right? There's a time and a place to suppress the experience enough to create a, a stability and a ground to start working from. Well, yeah. And you, when you talk about suppression, I mean, on on the ketamine it, on the one hand does have suppressive impact on say suicidal thinking, for example, or even symptoms of chronic depression. Um, that is faster than SSRIs uh, most of the time. And even to the point where some emergency rooms are giving people IV ketamine when they come in with suicidality. I mean, there's a, there's a step forward in terms of how quickly we can relieve pain there. Um, but it's interesting that ketamine also comes with this other opportunity that's not only about suppression. It's, there's also an opportunity to get after some of the um, underlying mechanisms of the depression. So, yeah, yeah we yeah, can have a whole exciting other conversation. It's a whole other thing, but it's such an exciting medicine in that way because it's got both this sort of quote unquote suppressive agent, but it also has quote unquote the expressive agent. 
And yeah. we're not sure about the other medicine, psychedelic medicines yet in regards to that. But that, it's very interesting how ketamine is doing both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Should we start wrapping up or? I guess so. It's, we, yeah. could go, we could go on for a long yeah. time here. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll do another conversation to uh, maybe go a little deeper in some of these areas another time. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for uh, interviewing me. That was uh, that was exciting and lively. Yeah, it was a lot of fun for me too. And I, um, I just want to thank you for taking the stand that you've taken in your life to. Um, push yourself to grow and see more possibilities. And um, it's really powerful to hear you talking about the the mission that you wanted to accomplish in the world of having a bigger impact than, you know, being a therapist, which already is a big impact in people's lives and realizing that you weren't going to be the kind of father you wanted to be unless you could find a deeper level of healing. I think it's, it's hitting me in a very um, deep place of just inspiration and respect for the journey that you've had. Uh, thanks, Will. Yeah, I appreciate hearing that. I, I think I also want to say to the listener um, to share this episode. Share episodes if these episodes are impacting you and you you want to spread what's happening on this podcast to other people that whether it's a client, a colleague, uh, a parent, a friend, like if you, if you, that is the way we, we can get all the information on this podcast is simply by you sharing it once. We have a lot of listeners on here. Um, and if this is something that you want in the hands of other people, um, that's how we spread the message. So I do encourage you to share this episode. If this one stood out to you in a certain way and you feel like someone could benefit from it. Yeah. Well, thanks, Will. Thanks, Keith. <laughs>